Well, I've said it before in my videos and I'll probably say it again. If you don't take advantage of your uh, parks in your area, you're missing out. Well, we've woken up this bright, beautiful morning to talk about defining. And we're gonna start with different kinds of definitions. Let's hit the trails. So we've got three broad kinds of definitions, and there are particular kinds after that. Okay. We got defining by extension, which is by pointing to the things to which, <laughs> the things that are, def uh, 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 you know, to which the definitions apply. We've got uh, defining by intention, which is, you know, the meaning Right, so extension's out here, right? So a extension of trees, all these trees. <laughs> uh, defining by intention is what we mean by tree, right? What words, what further definitions do we use to describe it, right? And uh, so that's defining by extension, defining by intention, and then we have defining by exclusion. Now, strictly speaking, defining by exclusion is not really defining, right? Because that, that's defining by what it's not. Right. So, you know, these are trees. They are not bushes. Okay. I mean, that, that's helpful in, in some way. But telling me that that is not a bush is not the same thing as telling me what it is. Because it's also not an elephant. And it's not a basketball court. <laughs> now, uh, so like I said, strictly speaking, defined by exclusion is not a definition, but that's okay. And in fact, none of these ways is, is perfect in for defining something. So if you're writing a paper, I wouldn't rely on just any one way to define any of the any of your terms. Right? Uh, I would use defining by exclusion, defining by intention, and defining by excuse me, defining by extension, defining by intention, and defining by exclusion. Use all of them. Okay? And if you're Doing a good job, uh, you know, providing definitions of, uh, with all these kinds, it, you'll have what about a three hundred word definition, you know, about a page, uh, which is you know, and it's not just you know just making up fluff, right? It, it's real work, yeah? uh, and you know, before you know it, these three to five page papers really aren't that hard to to fill. <laughs> So extension, intention, and exclusion. Let's take a look at defining by extension. So the first kind of definition we're gonna look at, uh, or with definition by extension, is a demonstrative definition. Now this might be a good time to point out a distinction between definitum and definines. A definitum is what you're defining. And definines is what's doing the defining. Right. So, uh, hey, Lou. So, suppose we're defining dog. Right. And if we're going to define by extension, uh, the definines will be instances of dog. Right. We're going to point to, or you know, mention the uh, you know in, in instances of the definitum. So the first kinds of definines. Uh, excuse me, the first kind of definition by extension is demonstrative definition. And that's just where you point to a particular case. So I'm going to define dog. Right there. That's a dog. <laughs> um, you, know, you have to have the definines right in front of you. Okay? And the, you know, the viewer or the person you're talking to has to be able to see what you're talking about. Uh, so, you know, maybe use a picture, you know, maybe you uh, are standing in front of the thing. Like in this case, we got this little dog here. Um, so this is defining, but this is demonstrative definition where the definines 
you know, you're pointing to an instance of the definines. The next kind of defining by extension is enumerative. Now, enumerative is where you're, you know, you know, demonstrative, you're right in front of the thing and you're pointing to it. Enumerative is where you're uh, listing off famous cases, right? particular instances. So uh, let's try cities, right? If I'm giving an enumerative definition of cities, I would simply start listing off famous cities. New York, uh, Atlanta, uh, Austin, San Antonio, right? Uh, these are all enumerative cases, enumerative uh, definines for city. Uh, and again, it's really important to use <laughs> Kind of famous cases, and you know one little shortcoming that I that you know, we have here, even with the uh, definines that I provided. So far, I've just listed American cities. So if uh, suppose somebody actually doesn't know what city means, but they know all these cities that I've just listed off, they might think that I'm just talking about American cities. Now, th you know, this isn't necessarily bad, but it does show a limitation of defining by extension. Even in the case where I provided the demonstrative definition of dog, if somebody really doesn't know what dog is and I point to my dog and say, that's dog, they might think that dog means pet, right? Or dog means cute or, or something like that, right? Um, now, again, it's not necessarily bad, but it shows kind of a limitation for uh, defining by extension. And every kind of defin every kind of definines that we're going to talk about has a limitation. And again, that's not necessarily bad, but it just shows that none is just complete and all all on its own. So we got a demonstrative definition, and we've got a enumerative definition. Let's keep going. Well, the next kind of definines by extension that we have is subclass. Now, subclass is kind of like enumerative. Enumerative is where you list particular instances of the definitum and, you know, famous instances. Well, subclass is where you list kinds, right? Or, you know, kinds within the definitum. So, uh, suppose we're providing a subclass definines of car, right? So, we could have sedan, hatchback, uh, two-door, four-door, uh, luxury. <laughs> um, we've got all kinds of ways where we can start def uh, providing a subclass definines for car. Suppose we're doing a subclass definines for tree. We can have oak, fir, cedar, ash, um, you know, all, you know, all these different subclasses of tree for a definines. Like I said, it's like enumerative. Enumerative, you're giving particular instances. Uh, subclass is where you're giving a list of kinds within that uh, uh, definines. Now that, that wraps up our three kinds of definines by extension. Uh, let's move on to definines by intention. So defining by extension is where you provide a definines by pointing to cases, listing instances, uh, of the definindum. Defining by intention is providing a definines uh, of meaning. Right? You're going to use further words and phrases as a definines as opposed to you know, you know, objects or cases. Right? So maybe uh, it's not, you know, people are going to argue about this, <laughs> but maybe a way of thinking about it is defining by extension is exterior to your mind. Defining by intention is defining by what's already in your mind. Okay, so uh, the, net, the first kind of defining by intention that we have is synonym. And this is where you provide a definines that is similar or <laughs> as close as you can get exact in meaning as uh, the definindum. So if we're going to define a dog, we might use a synonym canine, or pooch, or puppy, <laughs> or in today's internet vernacular, doggo. <laughs> um, 
you know, there's all kinds of ways to provide synonyms. Uh, suppose um, I want to define speed. I can talk about uh, swiftness, quick, um, acceleration. These are all similar, although not exact in meaning. And when providing a synonym for definines, you have to make sure you use a word that's more well known than the de than the definindum. So we all pretty much we, we we all pretty much know speed, right? But suppose somebody doesn't know the word speed, uh, and I provide the word alacrity for the definines. Well, alacrity is probably less well known <laughs> than speed, so that wouldn't be a good uh, synonym. Now, again, as with all these, uh, defining with uh, synonyms has its limitations. Uh, so first of all, the, the definines that you provide has to be known to the person you're talking to. Right? That would be good uh, when you're providing that sort of definines. And also, um, it may not necessarily be as exact. So, you, you know, I say alacrity. Well, suppose I'm defining alacrity and I use speed. Maybe it's kind of close to uh, alacrity. Speed and alacrity are close to each other, but they're not exact. Now, synonyms are helpful for kind of getting in the ballpark or trying to get somebody more or less acquainted, um, but they're not perfect. And again, none of these ways are perfect. Well, uh, that gives a synonym. Let's move on to the next defining by intention. Now, the next kind of defining by intention we're going to look at is etymological. Etymological definines is providing a definines of the history of a word. All right, so words have histories. They come from previous words, other languages, or earlier versions of uh, one's own language, or the, the language that belongs. Um, so, you know, we, we have mentioned speed. Well, an etymological definition of speed would be that it comes from an old English word, spoan, which in turn influenced Germanic languages, and then went back to influencing Old English <laughs> to speed or speed in. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, spoan means that the first version of it, the, uh, uh, the first word, right? Spoan means uh, to succeed or to prosper. So it's, it's interesting that you know, I imagine that's not what you thought. <laughs> you know, given what you already think speed means, uh, you know, by today's usage, uh, its history begins with a word that means to succeed or to prosper. Now, uh, words have histories, and it can get pretty interesting, you know, some of the histories of these. Uh, and when you provide an etymological definition, an etymological definines, you're giving at least part of that history. Well, the next kind of defining by intention is lexical. And this is probably the kind that you first think of when you think of a definition. You're providing a, a, a definines that's in the form grammatically, you know, of, of the sentence. And you could do this in one or two sentences. And, you know, one is best. Uh, now, with a lexical definition, you need to provide two things. You need to provide the genus and the differentia. The genus is the kind to which the definindum belongs. So remember earlier we dealt with dog? Well, the kind to which dog belongs is mammal. Okay. It's probably a little high up there. Lots of mammals. <laughs> um, but hey, mammal is a good start, right? Uh, the differentia is what distinguishes the definindum from other members of its kind. Uh, now, I am not enough of a veterinarian or a zoologist or biologist to give uh, the zoological definition or the you know, very precise definition of dog. So let's, let's switch examples. Let's go to, let's go to chair. Okay. So the definindum is chair. And the genus of the definindum, you know, it's not like, you know, rocking chair, desk chair, lounge chair, uh, recliner, right? No, that's a definines by subclass, right? Now you're providing kinds of the definindum, but we want the kind to which the definindum belongs. So we're not 
giving specific instances of the definite number going up in abstraction, <laughs> going to more abstraction. Right? So um, what kind of thing is a chair? Well, it's a piece of furniture, furniture. So the genus of chair is furniture. The, uh, the differentia is what distinguishes that piece of furniture, or that, you know, that, that definite from other members of its kind. Well, what's helpful here is to remember or to think of what other uh, kinds, or what other, <laughs> sorry, what other things belong to that kind. All right. So, you know, you might even work in reverse here, right? So we, we're working on the definite for chair uh, by trying to find the genus and the differentia. Well, one way to think about this is, well, let's start with the kind, furniture, and think of the subclasses. So we got chair, we got couch, we got table, we have desk, uh, we have ottoman, uh, lamp, right? These are all pieces of furniture. Okay, so we've got the definite chair, we have the genus furniture, we're looking for the di uh, differentia, that's what distinguishes chair from other pieces of furniture. Okay, well what distinguishes chair from say something like a table? Well you sit on a chair, Okay, good. We're on our way. But there are other pieces of furniture upon which you sit. What distinguishes a chair from a couch? Well, a, a chair is for one person to sit. Good again, right? So a chair is a piece of furniture for one person to sit, but we're not done yet. What distinguishes a chair from a stool? Stool. Well, a stool, a chair has a back and a stool does not. Okay, there we go. So a chair, it's a piece of furniture with a back for one person to sit. That's the genus and the differentia. And we've given a single sentence definition, single sentence definines for chair. Uh, by the way, being able to develop this skill is very useful. If you can provide a single sentence definition for the terms you're talking about off the top of your head, uh, you will be very capable at explaining yourself at a moment's notice. Um, and you know, give the impression, and hopefully not the delusion, that you know what you're talking about. All right, so we've been defining by extension and defining by intention. Now let's look at exclusion. Now, again, strictly speaking, defining by exclusion is not defining. <laughs> It's just sometimes helpful in maybe clearing up confusions or kind of getting a person in the ballpark. Um, and, you know, it's defining by what the definitive is not. And again, that is not, <laughs> that's not actually defining, right? Because, hey, look at that. That's not a computer. All right, but it doesn't tell me what it is. And if you're going to take that approach, right, I had to list everything that exists <laughs> everything else that exists besides that thing in order to provide that sort of definition by exclusion. But it, sometimes it can be useful. It's not always useful, but it can be useful. So uh, let's take the first way we're going to define by exclusion, and that's by, by defining by antonym. Now, defining by antonym uh, is, is actually a lot like synonym. Hmm. Uh, you're providing a word that's more or less the opposite. Right. So you're providing a definite that's more or less the opposite of the definite. This has you know varying degrees of precision, but you know it, it can be useful. Right. So um, yeah, laggard, right? That's a fun word, laggard. And somebody says, well, what's what's laggard? Well, you, you might you know start with the definite by antonym by saying, well, it's the opposite of quick, right. or the opposite of of uh, rapid. Right. Notice quick and rapid are both synonyms for speed. <laughs> I'm kind of touched on a theme here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so laggard, it's a fun word. So I was, well, what's laggard? Well, what, it's the opposite of quick, or it's the opposite of uh, speed, or uh, opposite of rapid. Rapid, excuse me, not rapid, rapid. Uh, so defining by antonym can be useful. It has some of the same rules as defining by synonym. You have to provide a word that's more familiar to the person than the than the definite item that you're uh, you know, then you're trying to uh, define, uh, and it, it helps. Uh, and it, you know, 
it can come with a varying degree of precision. So, you know, rapid is not an exact definition, uh, an exact antonym of lagger, but it's close, right? It's close. So, uh, in the, you know, the opposite direction. And another kind of peculiar thing about uh, defining by, providing an, uh, defines by antonym, excuse me, providing a definized by antonym is that uh, not every word, not every thing has an antonym. So, you know, we've got lots of trees around us. I have no idea what the antonym of tree would be. <laughs> um, so it's going to have its limited uses, but sometimes, sometimes it could be useful. And in this case, yeah, laggard, real quick antonym, rapid or quick. All right, we got one more definites by exclusion. Now, the last kind of defining by exclusion we're going to talk about is specious similar. And <laughs> you're probably not really familiar with this kind of definition. And in fact, I couldn't find a word <laughs> that means specious similar. So I had to resort to the clunky phrase, spe phrase specious similar. So when we're talking about specious similar, so talk about these instances where words kind of uh, get confused. Or definitums kind of get confused for one with one another. Uh, so one way we may think about it, talk about confusions of vagueness or confusions and ambiguity. But by the way, another one, the you know, vagueness and ambiguity are not the same thing. So those two might actually be cases of specious similars. And and really the the idea here is, especially if you're writing a paper, you want to just you know, set aside what you're not talking about, right? Say, okay, so the definitum that I'm dealing with here is sometimes confused with these other uh, words, these other meanings, but I'm not dealing with these things. So one of my favorites is uh, evolution and improvement, right? So sometimes we talk about a species evolving, right? And we're talking about, or, you know, a theory evolving or society evolving or an individual evolving. And you know, so you just need to evolve. Sometimes this is a phrase. Uh, and what they mean is, or people use this, what they mean is uh, improve. Right? So I, I'm more evolved. <laughs> or that, that society is more evolved than ours. What they mean is that society has improved. Okay, oh, that person has improved. Okay, but evolution does not mean improve. Right? Even the word progress. Sometimes we talk about making progress or, um, uh, you know, that, that person has made a lot of progress to mean that that person has improved or gotten better. But neither evolution nor progress mean improve. Right? Evolution is just, I mean, if we're dealing with the theory of evolution, that's just the, uh, uh, an explanation for the diversity of a species. But a species can go from, you know, good to bad <laughs> or, uh, um, you know, somehow better to somehow worse uh, through the process of evolution. I mean, probably chickens came from dinosaurs right? at some point. Um, just because a species has evolved, it doesn't mean it's gotten better. Um, you know, in our own area, the Texas blind salamander, right? Well, that species evolved and adapted to its environment, but it can't see anymore. And if you were to put that salamander, say, up here, it would have fewer capabilities than, you know, other lizards in this area. So it's not necessarily better. Right? And, and, you know, this is like a really bad version of Superman, right? Superman came from a, a tougher planet, so he evolved into a tougher being. It's like, no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. That's not how evolution works. <laughs> you don't become stronger by being in a worse environment. No. So, uh, you know, specious similars is where you're trying to distinguish uh, definitums from each other because we sometimes get them confused for whatever reason. Okay. So, yeah, specious similars. It's where you're uh, trying to you know, differentiate between two terms that sometimes get confused with one another. And, and again, they, it's not, strictly speaking, providing a definite, but it's trying to make sure that you're on target right from the beginning. And frankly, when you're dealing with papers, right, and if you're writing out a nice explication of a term, 
it might be helpful to start out with a species similar, say, look, this is not what I'm talking about. I want to distinguish this right away. Right? Okay, I mean, that, that might be helpful when, when you're writing. Okay, so we got our three kinds of definines. We got intention, extension, and exclusion. Exclu uh, ex extension is by pointing to cases or instances. That's right? uh, what's exterior to the mind. <laughs> intention is <coughs> defining, providing a definines using meaning. And then exclusion is defining, even though it's not really defining, defining by what it's not. Right? And with these, what, eight kinds of uh, definines, uh, you can clearly, very clearly, explain what you're talking about to someone else, and perhaps most importantly, to yourself.